So, hello everyone. Um, welcome to our USD webinar, PCI DSS in the cloud, best practices in PCI DSS 4.0, new version. Uh, my name is Kai Schubert and I'm happy to be here with you and my colleague Markus to give you an overview about the newest topics on this. Uh, first, as a short introduction from ourselves. My name is uh, Kai Schubert. I'm working with USD since more than eight years, starting as a PCI QSA, as an assessor, doing a lot of assessments, uh, getting quite fast contact also with uh, cloud assessments. And that's what I'm doing since the last years. Um, I'm nowadays a cloud expert and responsible for everything that regards to cloud security and uh, in USD. And I'm here today, yeah, to, to answer all the questions with regard to the cloud services and I will hand over to Markus because he's the one who's responsible for PCI. Yeah, thank you Kai. Um, hi, my name is Markus. Um, yeah, also working for USDAG as a PCI DSS auditor and a QSA. Um, yeah, we saw several uh, customers that already had the transition to the cloud and so that's uh, my part in this webinar here um, to talk about the new PCI DSS 4.0 requirements um, with a special focus on the cloud topics and yeah, how can the cloud help you to fulfill the new requirements and also what are the issues or problems or challenges um, if you transition to the cloud in the new PCI DSS 4.0 center. Okay, then let's go ahead. First of all, uh, no worries. You don't have to take a lot of notes. We will send you the presentation afterwards via email. So um, you will get this at uh, what we're showing you right now as a PDF file. And of course, we are looking forward to answer all of your questions if possible. Uh, so please feel free to put them into the chat anytime right now starting and we will going to answer them at the end of this webinar. But please, if you have already some questions or somewhere in between, just put them into the chat and then we'll follow up on that. Okay, um, let's see what's next. Um, we have the what we have on our agenda. Okay, that's the agenda. As I said, first part, we'll talk about cloud and payment. Second, about his compliance in the cloud. And of course, at the end, we'll have a summary and a discussion. So now we uh, got done with the technical topics. Uh, we start with the current status. So what's up with PCI at the moment? What happened during the last years? <clears throat> and of course, I guess most of you are already now aware of that the cloud train kind of make a lot of speed during the last years. We have a huge rush of cloud adoption and we can see in the timeline we have here uh, what happened during the last 15 or yeah, 15 years almost uh, until 2010 almost all the bigger cloud service providers like aws microsoft azure and also google cloud are entering the market and we see between two, 2010 2015 we see uh, kind of an first phase of experimenting a lot of startups, first fintech companies who are util that were utilizing the cloud. And of course, since they're also doing a lot of payment stuff, they were also forced to be compliant. And that's why they also were heading to us or other QSA companies. And we were giving first consultancy on this. And starting at around 2.15, uh, we have a first rush. So that means between 2000, 2015 and 2020, we see a lot of first PCI certifications of new environments, of migrated environments. And this was a kind of a yeah, yeah, first rush, as I saw it, as I said. And the next step or the next acceleration of this process, of course, was the COVID pandemic, which means that uh, because of Corona, uh, there was this huge strong trend to the cloud and also we forgot dependent and that's goes for the same. So what are the drivers for move to the cloud? Um, some of them are quite obvious, of course. You don't have to care, take care of it about your, your own data center. You can move away from it. You do not have this old processes to take a lot of time, cost a lot of money. You can utilize 
or you can yeah use the all the advantages of the cloud computing you have the availability issues the elasticity the flexibility the automation of a lot of layers which is a really big topic we'll come back to this later and of course you can utilize any kind of modern development styles like HR development, DevOps things, things like that. You can focus on your core business, which means you uh, you can outsource things like fraud prevention, backup services, logging stuff, and fully concentrate on your own business. Um, if you are already having kind of old infrastructure being deployed in a data center, you can have a kind of a replacement for your old end of life infrastructure you can migrate straight toward the cloud and last but not least and this is something we will cover more into the details right now is that pci compliance is becoming much easier in the in the early days between 215 and 2020 it was still sometimes a lot of discussion between the cloud service provider the customer and the qsa how to get compliant there what needs to take care of and things like that but this changed a lot during the last years, and uh, yeah, that's that's something we also want to give you a better understanding how how this has changed. Uh, sh just a short overview about the big players. You already or almost know know of them. Of course, we have AWS uh, as the biggest player in the market that cover almost a third uh, with market share. They have the longest experiences in this and they have so many services you can't count them a lot of them are already pci certified and what is really important with aws and then if you have to name or if you pick one thing out of many of them from a technical perspective is that they still have the so-called ap first mandate which means any kind of service they offer you for you it will have and fully functional API from day one. So that means uh, if you're into automation, if you're into getting things scalable and, and easily being kind of programmed, so to say, then this is something that uh, will work for you good. Um, of course, there are others. We have Microsoft Azure starting later in the game. They are now discovering almost a fraud, like 23% of the market share. And of course, the, the unique selling point here is that they have a lot of services being integrated with other Microsoft services and products. Uh, you, you know them like M365 and, and other stuff. And last but not least, we have the Google Cloud, which is uh, much, much smaller from a percentage. This is about a tenth of the market at the moment, but they are kind of unique selling point here is that they are offering services on a really large scale. So if you have requirements with a huge data load, huge uh, throughput, then Google Cloud is the one that you can go for because they can cover this best. Um, this is, yeah, th those are the main three providers that are, yeah, in, uh, at least in our area, the, the, the important players. And if you look at the payment industry and then market shares here, there's a difference because on, on, on yeah, covering the whole market, we have this on the first AWS, then we have Azure and then GCP. With payment, it's a little bit different. We did a market study at the beginning of this year, and there we see that, especially in the European market, approximately 70, 75% of the market share runs their PCI related workloads in AWS. Following is GCP uh, as a second with approximately 10 or 50 percent of market share here. And now at the third is Azure with just some examples. So there's much less percentage of market share by comparison. If I go just shortly back here, they have a fourth of the market in here is much less. But we can also have a look at the relationship between about, yeah, about cloud computing and the different PCI standards. Um, we're talking all the time about PCI DSS, but we can also have a look to all the other standards because it's not only about DSS, it's also about others. So maybe Marcus, you can give us a short overview. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, like Kai already mentioned, uh, PCI DSS here at the top uh, is the yeah, biggest standard uh, right now. So uh, with the 
yeah, huge amount of customers. Um, also, uh, we as a company um, have several customers in different market sectors uh, like um, fashion and also payment service providers and um, yeah, other service providers, for example, like housing, etc. cetera, um, so who must fulfill the PCI DSS. A lot of these um, yeah, customers have already migrated to the cloud or are right now in a migration phase. And we also completed um, yeah, a lot of assessments uh, in different clouds. So we um, completed assessments together with the customers in AWS, GCP, and also in Azure. Uh, so yeah, there are really a lot of customers already um, performing their assessments in the cloud uh, without um, yeah, any major issues here. So this is definitely um, yeah, the most adapted standard when it comes to the cloud. Uh, for PCI 3DS, uh, it's a bit different. Um, so here we see the first steps that are made into the cloud environment. So um, yeah, some pilot projects, uh, proof of concepts um, are in process, but we don't see uh, yeah, that huge adaption as we have in um, PCI DSS standard. Um, for PCI PIN and P2PE, uh, yeah, it's even less than in uh, PCI 3DS. It's um, yeah only um, yeah ju just in the really early beginnings. Um, so um, yeah, not not even in the POC phase. So there we haven't seen anything um, that yeah that there is a trend right now to um, move into the cloud with their um, PCI scopes. Yeah, we may expect uh, that in the near future there might be a shift into the cloud um, because of new certifications of the cloud service providers that will um, yeah, make the life of the uh, PCI PIN and P2PE assessments a bit easier. So maybe um, there would be also a shift into the cloud, um, but it's hard to say. For PCI SSF, we expect that there will be a shift. So um, because here we had um, the yeah, uh, standard that was um, yeah, previously active, the PA DSS standard. So um, the yeah, SSF is a successor of the PADSS. And while PADSS um, strictly um, forbid to have a software as a service application that is certified, um, this is no longer the case for PCI SSF. So um, yeah, mainly speaking, um, there was a um, yeah, there was a um, phrase in the PADSS standard that um, explicitly said if your application is a software as a service application. Um, it's not allowed to be uh, certified against PADSS. And this passes is now gone in the PCI SSF standard. Um, while it now already says um, that some software uh, can be provided as a service, and also there are the first requirements. We even mention something like where software as a service is used, you need to fulfill the following points. So yeah, right now it's definitely no longer forbidden to have this. And because of that, we think that yeah, some customers might now also start uh, to explore the cloud a bit, uh, especially in the software as a service context, because yeah, like I mentioned, it's no longer forbidden. And therefore, um, it's most likely that at least some of the customers will start exploring the cloud in the SSF context also. Yeah, and that's it uh, about the overview. So um, yeah, like I said, PCI DSS with the yeah, greatest amount of audits. And now I give it back to Kai to talk a bit about trends and risks. Okay, thank you, Marcus. So now have you seen what happened so far? We'll have a look more. Yeah, what's up next? And also we need to what we need to consider. What kind of risks might come uh, within the next uh, future? Uh, for the trends, and we mentioned this here because we'd like to give you a bit, a little bit better of understanding why we're talking about this topic. And still, I mean, cloud is nothing very new, but it's still sometimes in some parts of, especially Europe and in Germany, something still being taken as a new thing, and also be still taken as a kind of a new trend or or even a kind of new, yeah that this being just some make marketing stuff, but it is not because cloud computing uh, can be seen as a kind of a paradigm shift in a way that 
that also it becomes a kind of basic infrastructure that has become with other infrastructure in, in, in former times. So for instance, nowadays in, in modern societies, in Western societies, we are completely used to the situation do you, that you have warm water running out of yeah, the tap, that you have a tap of fresh water, that you have electricity, that you have other kind of basic services all the time available. available. And this goes also for, for cloud uh, computing, I guess, during the next years, because it's something that you can just rely on demand. It's not something that you have to take care of. It's just you, you, you realize, okay, there's a need for that, uh, on a business perspective also, and then you just, yeah, you're gonna use it and that's it. And uh, of course, this is not something that works for all. This kind of running IT as a special kind of yeah, handling IT and running IT and operate IT. Uh, there are of course exceptions, but for the most use cases, uh, this will, will be true. Uh, of course, there are exceptions for, for instance, workloads that are highly specialized or non-elastic workloads like the ones you maybe heard of. Uh, for instance, there has been Dropbox moving to the cloud. And of course, the main purpose for a company like Dropbox is to store data. And uh, of course, they first moved there and then they realized, OK, that might be a little bit expensive if I do it just uh, with, a, with a cloud service provider and they moved back. So they moved back from the cloud. They, they stopped their outsourcing there and do it again on their own. But for the most companies and for the most organization, a move to the public cloud will be, will be I guess, the, the, the normal next step, kind of, but not all of them, of course. So what does it mean for, for PCI? Uh, what kind of impacts or trends we see here? The changes for the scope is, is, is on some parts really huge and sometimes really yeah, warm welcome from <laughs> both sides for the assessor as well as for the customer because uh, the scope topic itself is being changing a lot. Uh, nowadays, utilizing a cloud service provider makes it much, much easier to separate the PCI scope from the rest of your IT infrastructure and not having the same discussion again and again and again every year with your QSA, what is in scope, what is out of scope, what is a security impacting system and what is not. Um, this is something because of the inherent technologies and, and, and uh, things that are yeah, part of the cloud, things like a zero trust uh, methodology and things like that are so important and they are uh, help to, to move this in a better way. Uh, on mm -hmm. the other side, the changes we will see that uh, a lot of people and a lot of organizations are focusing on their own business, business outsourcing a lot of things to external cloud service providers like for instance, tokenization, like fraud prevention. Those are things that in former times have been done a lot of by companies by their own, but nowadays can be outsourced as a SaaS solution. We'll come back to this later on. It's important that you have to take care of some, some topics here. And of course, we will see some, some changes for, for new standards that we already covered. We will see changes here for 3DS. We will see for PIN and SSF, of course. Um, but also we will see changes in regard to the complexity and to the amount of work you need to run a PCI environment. Uh, the one topic that we have here is key management and uh, maybe yeah, some of you are familiar with this topic. If, do, if you do it on your own, if you do it on your own business, on your own scope and an on-premise data, uh, on data center, then this is something that might be a hassle. It's a lot of work, it's a lot of process, it's a lot of technical stuff and you need highly skilled people and a lot of responsibilities to do this right. And there might be, especially at the beginning of a certification for the first and the second certification, a lot of findings there. And key management within utilizing and done by cloud services like AWS, uh, KMS or Azure's um, Key Vault are much easier to, to handle and much easier to utilize for key management as we will see later. But before we come, before we go into details, we need to cover shortly also some kind of challenges and risks that come with the cloud and what kind of things you need to consider. Uh, here we have the five most important things that you need to take care of. 
Uh, of course, there is the, the, and that's why it's on the top, it's always about people, uh, staff shortage, also in cloud as uh, a topic, as most probably everyone knows. We have topics like information, security, data privacy, last but not least also the vendor login. If you go for AWS or someone else, and then if you do not take care of what your architecture and what kind of services and how, do you, how you're going to use them, you will quite easily and quite fast being vendor locked in. You're kind of, you have a strong dependency on, the, on them. And this is something also you have to take care of. But the one thing that we'd like to talk about is the PCI compliance risk because we are not talking about PCI compliance today. And the one advantage on the one hand side is that this new PCI version, the 4.0, is being created with cloud in the mind. Um, what do I mean with we, if we say it's created with cloud in mind is that uh, by comparison, the old standard, or the 3.2.1, uh, has been a very agnostic approach and it's not talking about technology, of course, because they were independent and it's up to you how you're going to solve these requirements and how you fulfill them. Uh, this case goes the same for the 4.0, but we will find the term cloud itself quite a lot in comparison to the old standard. And because the council realized that this paradigm shift needs to be covered. And that's why you will find a lot of requirements that say something specific about the use case if you are utilizing any kind of cloud service. And we'll come back to this later. So this is something as we see as an advantage. But on the other side, and this is a more risk or something that is, uh, can be a trick and can be a little bit tricky, is if, you, if you're running hybrid environments. PCI compliance in this case can become a lot of more work and a lot of yeah, things that need to be considered, um, which means if you have on the one hand side an on-premise infrastructure and on one hand side a cloud infrastructure and this yeah, being connected and doing things uh, together, this can lead to neglect of at least one side of those and lead to less security and less compliance on one of those sides. Uh, as you can imagine, most probably it's the on-premise infrastructure. And um, this is something that we cannot really um, recommend. So this is something quite normal during a transition phase, of course, but on a long term, it's something you should avoid. Uh, hybrid infrastructure makes it com more complicated. The certification means also is a much lar larger scope because you do have to cover two very different technical stacks and two very different processes and, and things that you have to be that you need to do, for instance, for PCI compliance. So in the short term or in the short run, PCI compliance usually is easier to achieve cloud native if you run it only on the cloud than on-premise, which is a completely different story like seven years ago or seven or eight years ago. So nowadays it's much more easy in the cloud than, than before and easier than on-premise, which is a huge difference and make changed a lot actually. So before, so we, if you look at for this more in the duty details, we have some general recommendations and best practices here. Uh, I guess this one is quite well known, the so-called shared responsibility model. Uh, so there is no cloud presentation uh, without this, <laughs> um, but this is important and that's why we also can raise your awareness to this topic once again. If you are going to the cloud and if you want to use a cloud service, then you need to consider or need to keep in mind that you do not shift away all the responsibility to the cloud provider. It is also something, there is something still left that is up to you and which AWS started first, and nowadays all the cloud providers adapted this approach, which means on the one hand side, and then you can see it here on the bottom, uh, the CSP is responsible for the security, security of the cloud, which means, for instance, physical infrastructure, virtualization, and so on. And on the other side, uh, you as a cloud customer are, secure, are responsible for the security in the cloud. Um, the, tr the, the, the tricky part on this is actually that this thin blue line you can see here can move. So it's not always clear if you're going to use this or that service where this line is being drawn. And you need to clarify and 
document with your cloud service provider which or who is for what responsible. And this shift of responsibilities needs to be considered, needs to be documented, and also being verified by your QSA within the annual audit. So um, take care of this. It's important. Uh, scoping and things like that are never getting easy, and this needs to be thought of. And we give you some examples for this. For instance, if we have some AWS services like the WAF, like the web application uh, firewall, then AWS, for instance, is responsible for all kind of software updates on the one hand side, and on the other side, you as a customer are responsible for the rule set. So to make a definition what kind of rules are to apply. Um, similar is it is also for the database services like uh, PostgreSQL, MySQL, and so on. AWS on the one hand side handles anything related to software updates, patching, and so on. And on the other side, you're responsible for the configuration. That means you're responsible for the data retention policy, for the encryption of the database, as well as for logging topics and so on. Um, for key management services, uh, for instance, AWS is responsible for the quality of the keys that are being generated and being managed, as well as for the access to the keys itself. Uh, and on the other side, uh, of course, uh, you as a customer, you decide and you have to find, you have to configure and finally what kind of key rotation is being deployed. If you rotate keys at all, and then if you do so, at what kind of uh, period. Um, to, to make a conclusion with regard to the services, how this works and what you have to take care of. Uh, if you're going to use uh, one of the cloud services and dedicated services offered by one of the providers, first check their compliant services on their website. They will find a huge list and they will find all the services that are, be, that are being compliant, for instance, for PCI. But as you can see, there are a lot of other standards that you can also check for. And of course, your QSA will ask for the even more important documentation of this for the attestation of all compliance from AWS or the others, where it needs to be stated that this or that specific kind of service that you want to use is being certified in this or that region. So as a take, major takeaway, we have two things. On the one hand side, if the service is not listed, don't rely on it. So especially not for PCI compliance, of course. So check this first. And as a second, of course, you're responsible for the configuration of the service because just using it doesn't mean it's compliant. You need to be make it compliant by configuring it actually. So that's it for the general recommendations. And now we go more into details with the new version. Yeah, Those thank things. you, Kai. Yeah, maybe let's start with um, yeah, something something um, yeah general here. Um, that's a topic about multiple cloud and software as a service solutions basically so um most of you know already the yes, three big players uh, kai mentioned also earlier on his slides aws azure and um gcp so but there are more so it's not only about um yeah the topic here infrastructure as a service there are also other cloud services or software as a service applications that you might be using within your pci scope and um you might not even uh, consider it or think about it, but this is one very important topic um, to reconsider or to um, maybe check uh, your infrastructure uh, of any other services that you are using to fulfill uh, PCI requirements or that could impact the security of your um, cardholder data environment. Uh, so here is a yeah here is a list of a few examples on this slide here. Uh, on topics we um, yeah sometimes see during the audits and um, yeah also sometimes it happens that customers get just for example transitioned to to a cloud solution for example like um, they use the logging and alerting tool for several years right now and this tool now ended the support for the on-premise hosting so they yeah just move to the cloud because they are forced maybe by their service provider and if they do that, uh, then it's also very important to realize that if you were covering PCI requirements by the solution, um, like, for example, the logging part, uh, then you also need to check that this service right now, so the service provider, 
is PCI compliant? Um, yeah, that, that the services are operated in a PCI compliant manner. Because previously, if, if you had it on your on-premise environment, during your PCI DSS assessment, uh, the QSA uh, usually would assess your underlying operating system, uh, for example, like your syslog server or anything else. Um, but right now, um, yeah, you, you are no longer possible to have this kind of underlying uh, yeah, operating system to be assessed in the audit because that's yeah, outsourced to your uh, SAAS solution provider. And that's why it's very important that you also check that these services are PCI compliant if you yeah, use them in the credit card data environment or they have a security impact. Um, also, one point um, I just want to yeah, stress out again, uh, what Kai already mentioned, is that you really need to collect the AOC of your service providers before the audit um, so that you don't yeah, just do the transition and then realize afterwards that they are not even compliant and yeah, then it might cause um, yeah, several issues during your audit or you, in the worst case, need even to roll back your uh, new integration. Um, so that's that's really important uh, to consider here. Um, yeah. So the topics listed here, you you yeah, just need to ask yourself the question: If the service you are using has a security impact, um, if it has on the CDE, then it's most likely in scope. So for example, um, maybe we can talk about one other point here on this slide, which is um, the configuration management. So just if you for example, think about Ansible, Puppet, uh, SaltStack, or maybe um, if you are already in the cloud, Terraform or something else. Um, it could be hosted on your on-premise systems. But if you, for example, source this out to a service provider, they usually have um, yeah, right access to your whole environment because they can yeah, just run the deployments and this would definitely have a security impact and therefore it is in scope and the service provider would also be in scope. And yeah, the same questions you should ask for your other services that you are using in your PCI environment. Um, one point I'd like to stress out also a bit more here on this slide and also on the next slide is um, the code hosting topic because this one is um, yeah, new in the 4.0 standard. Um, the orange box at the top of the slide um, citates the standard um, and it says that if the code repository has a security impact, so here we are at the security topic, um, security impact topic again, then it is in scope of your PCI DSS assessment. So um, this is right now in the PCI DSS photo zero standard explicitly mentioned. It was not in the old one. Um, and what does that mean for your environment? So you should again, like discussed on the earlier slide, ask yourself the question, does the code or does it, a code repository have any security impact on your cardholder data environment? And if it's the case, yeah, you should consider it in the audit and also in your yeah, first maybe PCI DSS 4.0 assessment, the assessor might ask just this question. So do you have any code repositories? Where are they hosted? So do you have them on premise um, or is, are they outsourced uh, as a SaaS application? Um, and if they are outsourced, are these services also PCI DSS certified? Um, so one really important thing to consider here is if there really is a security impact and if you maybe also can reduce the security impact here. For example, like um, security impact could be if you use some kind of CI/CD pipelines in your code repository that are hosted by a SAAS provider. And if you do this, what kind of work do the CI/CD pipelines perform? So for example, if you have your whole deployment within your CI/CD pipeline, so they, for example, run your Terraform scripts to deploy your infrastructure, yeah, then this has pretty obvious a security impact. Or for example, like, if you have any mission critical secrets in your um, code repository, for example, like in environment variables or something like that, um, yeah, this could also be considered as a security impact because um, yeah, these secrets could be used, for example, to manipulate something in your environment. So these are all topics you should 
consider regarding code repositories if you are moving them or already have moved them to a software as a service solution. Um, so these examples were, let's say, a bit of the um, yeah um, bad parts or uh, considerations you need to uh, to make uh, if you move to the cloud. So to yeah to say to keep things in mind and um, yet yeah, cloud does not really help you uh, necessarily uh, by this. Maybe this is one topic where cloud could make things a bit more complicated, but if they are certified, then yeah, you should be fine. Um, or the service is certified, you should be fine. So in the following slides, um, yeah, I'd like to discuss more about the, let's say positive impacts or how can the cloud help you to fulfill the new requirements. Um, and therefore, we picked some requirements that, um, yeah, that are new in PCI DSS 4.0 and um, that can be easier fulfilled by leveraging the cloud possibilities. So for the first um, requirement I'd like to mention here is uh, heat cryptographic hashes. Um, that's new in 4.0. So before 4.0, you just could hash your PAN, so your uh, card number data or your customer's card number data, and store the hash value in your database. So, for example, you could just use some regular hash like uh, SHA-256 or similar, and you were fine, basically. Uh, starting in 2025, uh, the new standard requires you to have um, yeah, a keyed cryptographic hash for this. So SHA-256 would no longer be sufficient. But you need to use something like HMAC, GMAC, CMAC um, to yeah to um, store your cardholder data. And the issue here could be that you not only need to store them with this new hashing algorithm, but for the key part in this hash algorithm, you need also to fulfill all the yeah key management requirements of the PCI DSS. So mainly speaking, requirements 3.6 and 3.7. Uh, just to mention some topics here that need to be considered. That would be a lot of documentation. So you would need um, to have key custodians. Um, so people that have access to the keys, uh, they must um, acknowledge that they yeah, understand their responsibilities um, by yeah, having access to these keys, etc. Uh, you also need to implement some uh, secure mechanism to store these keys and you need to have um, defined crypto periods so how long are your keys allowed to live and when um, yeah, do they need to be rotated uh, and of course you also need to implement the rotation then afterwards once you define your crypto period and um, yeah some some other topics and how can the cloud help in the solution. Um, Kai already mentioned it earlier. Uh, if you use, for example, the KMS and AWS or other key management services in the other uh, cloud provider solutions, most of them um, are already PCI DSS certified. That means they can reduce the amount of work uh, that you have in regards of cryptography a lot. So um, if you're using a certified yeah, key management service, this could yeah, rotate your keys automatically. So you just need to define how often your key is rotated, but the whole yeah, process by itself is then outsourced to your cloud service provider. So that means you don't need to, yeah, to take care of any of these anymore. Um, maybe to put it a bit into numbers, if we have a yeah, classic traditional key management session in a PCI DSS audit with an on-premise environment and yeah, let's say, self-managed keys um, only, then we need uh, two to two and a half hours time for the session to have all the key management processes explained, uh, check that everything um, is fine and also documented, etc. And if we have um, yeah, a proper implementation in the cloud, we uh, wouldn't even need half of the time. So in most cases, half of an hour is already sufficient uh, to just check that you configured your KMS service correctly um, and that you set the uh, crypto period and rotations. And yeah, so all rest uh, is then just covered by the certification of your cloud provider. So this would usually save you a lot of time yeah, in the audit sessions and also, of course, a lot of work in the um, preparation to the audit. 
Um, yeah, one other topic um, I'd like to talk about is web application firewalls. So I guess many of you um, yeah, already know that the web application firewalls were part of the earlier PCI DSS standard also, so the 3.2.1 standard, but um, they were not mandatory. So the difference here is that it was earlier, it was allowed that you could have um, a manual security assessment for your web applications. So you could yeah, perform basically um, a yeah, manual assessment of these and there was no automation needed. But uh, starting um, 2025, that is no longer allowed. So the manual um, yeah, security review uh, is no longer allowed and you need to have an automated solution here. Um, also, uh, you need to either block or so automatically block attacks, or if you don't do that and just you have alerts, then these alerts would be needed to be immediately followed. So um, yeah, you also need to have 24 seven personal available or a SOC team or something like that, uh, that is capable of following alerts of your web application firewall. So here the cloud can also reduce the amount of work if you yeah, don't have a web application firewall already. In most cloud environments, you can just um, yeah, click uh, a few times and you have a web application firewall in place. You can also place it freely in your environment and in your data flows. So for example, like you can put it before or after your load balancer or um, yeah, in any other position in your infrastructure where it makes most sense. Um, and this is really easy and straightforward and you don't need to yeah, let's say reconnect wires or something like that or uh, change uh, routing tables um you just can yeah basically activate it and put it in front of any application you might have um so another point here is uh, what i already mentioned also earlier you don't need to take care of the whole underlying operating uh, system etc so uh, if you use the cloud certified web application firewall, you can yeah, just activate it uh, basically, and um, you don't need to take care of um, operating system patches, um, yeah, the user management of the operating system, uh, antivirus solutions, um, something like that. Uh, also the logging topic is most likely covered by your cloud provider because you can directly ship the logs to the yeah, logging solution provided. Um, by your cloud provider and that makes the whole process a bit easier um, anyways what you should do um, yeah also coming back to the earlier topics is to consider the security in the cloud topic here um, that you need to define your rule sets um, according to your application so the web application firewall of your cloud service provider would also be shipped with a default rule set but you should um, anyways just think about your application and your yeah maybe specialities in your application so maybe there are some um unique use cases in your app and you should uh, define custom rules for this also to cover get yeah, to cover your application specific topics here um so not just use the standard rules so security in the cloud define your own rule set in addition to the standard rules but anyways um yeah a lot of um, yeah, issue and uh, trouble is already reduced by using the cloud provided solution here. Yes, this brings me to my last slide for the new requirements. Um, yeah, this is all about account management. As you can see, this is um, yeah, a rather huge uh, information flow here. So we have a lot of requirements here in regards to account management. Um, so this is also one of the let's say, biggest changes uh, when it comes to PCI DSS 4.0. So requirement seven and eight, there were a lot of um, yeah, smaller or bigger changes in the new standard. Um, for example, like on the top left, we have now the new requirement to review all your accounts, including technical accounts, so human users and technical accounts. Uh, periodically so you need to have um, yeah, a review of these and the cloud can help to perform this so this is not something that is yeah fully automated in the cloud but if you have a central module um, to manage your users 
then you could just take this access module and grab a list of all your users and their permissions. And then you can perform the review manually. Um, but it's a lot of easier than uh, in the yeah traditional on-premise solutions where you might have multiple um, yeah local accounts or maybe uh, you have yeah you have several uh, systems and several local user accounts which you all need uh, to manage manually and you need to um, yeah check their privilege log on to each system and confirm that yeah the least privilege principle is followed so if you have this in a central place maybe in the cloud in an AAM, IAM solution, you could have um, yeah, much less effort for this. Uh, same goes for the next point here, the multi-factor authentication, um, which is or will be in 2025 required for all access into the CDE. In the three to one standard, it uh, was just required for administrative access. Um, and starting 2025, it will be required for all access, but this shouldn't also cause a lot of trouble if you are in cloud environments because um, yeah, here you could just um, enforce the MFA basically for every user and also have a very quick and easy review if the MFA is really in place and enforced. So if you think about the yeah, previous example that, you, uh, that I um, brought up, uh, if you have the on-premise systems that need to log on and maybe check the pump configuration of each system, this could be quite a lot of work. And um, usually yeah, in the cloud, if you're using the IAM, you have all the information in one place. Okay, coming to the right side of the slide, this is all about credentials and credential management of your users. Um, the first point here, is about the management uh, of application accounts that can be used to interactively log in. This means that there is an application account, but this account can be used in the same way as a normal user. For example, if you think about um, an SSA connection and you have some kind of automation, uh, maybe an Ansible system uh, or just a script or something like that, that logs into another system, um, for example, by using SSH, you could in theory just use the same login procedure by your normal user. So you could impersonate the yeah, technical user. And this is no longer allowed. So you need to prevent this usage. That means um, that it should be no longer possible to even perform this interactive login. So if you um, think about my example, it might be hard to yeah, do this for the Ansible use case because um, yeah, if you have a bot user for Ansible, for example, um, then it's yeah, hard to prevent the interactive login. One possibility, for example, would be to use only your personalized user. So you're just starting your Ansible scripts from your machine or from a dedicated machine where you need to log in, but then it's hard to have automations in place. Um, so it's also not optimal, but you need to consider this. And the cloud can yeah, reduce the amount of work here also. Um, then, yeah, depends on your situation, how you want to use the services. One possibility would be to um, implement direct job-to-job -job communication so that there is no technical user at all. So you don't even have a technical user. Uh, that means you yeah, just leverage the capabilities of the cloud and um, yeah, allow jobs or services to directly communicate without having yeah, special users in place um, so that there are even no credentials at all. So if there are no credentials, of course, um, yeah, you don't need to manage anything here. Uh, that's yeah, a lot easier than um, yeah, maybe think about some kind of workarounds or uh, anything else. The same goes for the next topic here for um, the storage of credentials. So it's no longer allowed to store credentials in config files or similar. So here, same example, if you use direct job to job communication and don't have yeah, secrets and credentials at all, you don't need to do anything here to fulfill this. So yeah, this uh, eliminates the requirement basically. So this um, also saves a lot of work. And last but not least, the rotation of the secrets. 
Um, this is also new, so you need to periodically rotate secrets also for technical or especially for technical users here. That means um, that all your API tokens and yeah, access tokens or whatever you are using uh, need to be rotated. So same as yes, password policy, you now need to um, yeah, put an expiry date to all these uh, technical user credentials and rotate them also. So this could in some cases cause issues, for example, like if you rotate an API key um, for the user account, but you forget to rotate it on one application, there might be an issue that this application can no longer access the user and you might, uh, in the worst case, have an outage. So um, this is, of course, not something uh, anybody wants. And um, therefore, it also makes sense to try to leverage the cloud features here. Um, it can be fully automated here to, to have these uh, secrets rotated in many cloud environments so that you don't need to get yeah, to worry about this. And it's yeah, managed for you uh, or like yeah, discussed many times now, you could just try to prevent the use of technical users at all. And then also this requirement here should be no issue for you to fulfill. Yeah, so that's basically all I have to say for the new requirements regarding the cloud. Maybe one short disclaimer here. Uh, of course, these are not all the new requirements we have in PCI 4.0. So there are many more, um, but in this webinar, we just focused on the requirements that might cause issues uh, in the cloud or that yeah might be easier to fulfill if you leverage the cloud services. So just uh, that you are aware that this is not a full comprehensive list of all the new requirements in the 4.0 standard. Yeah, and that's it from my part. And I'll hand over again to Kai um, yeah, for the summarization and further discussions. Okay, thank you very much, Markus. So as a short summary, um, we'd like to come back to the first part where we already said, as a general, recommendation if you're going to think about going into the cloud check first is your cloud service provider with the dedicated service you're going to use being certified that's the first question check on this first and normally nowadays with the main bigger players there's there are no worries that's that's normally not an issue uh, but secondly if you start with this take care that you are responsible for the security in the cloud for the configuration of those services that you utilize. That's quite important for your PCI compliance. So that's it for the general recommendations in, in short. And as a second, I think the new requirements that Marcus has shown us, I think there are two, there are two kind of requirements, at least from my point of understanding. On the one hand side, you have very technical things like the key management stuff and the, the web application thing. A web application a firewall that makes it easier for you if you're already in the cloud or going there because the service provider takes care for most of it for most of it and also he takes care for the new requirements because he has so many customers he, you are not the only one from him actually uh, then those things are already there they are compliant they're being certified and you just have to maybe change something in the meaning of some configurations things but that's it you can fulfill the requirements from the start. So that's that's the technical one. Let's make things more easy and then that's okay. And on the other part, of course, there are some more kind of organizational kind of requirements or topics like the uh, utilization of other cloud, especially SaaS providers, or the topic about repos, how do you, how do you utilize your code and how do you manage your code? or even more important to, to put the old topics with regard to identity and access management. Those are things, of course, they might give you kind of trouble at the beginning. They are kind of an, uh, something yeah, you, you have to think about and how to solve this. And I'm sure we will have a lot of discussions, especially Marcus and his team during the next weeks and months uh, and then all the different cases because each case is unique. And that's why we all, as I always say, well, it depends, and then we need to look into the context and the very specific use case. But for those three things that we explained, um, I think 
those PCI requirements quite nice to give you kind of a push as an organization to think about these things because you need them all over the organization. It's not only about the PCI scope. If you think about identity access management, you need it all over the place. And if you do it right on a PCI scope, if you do it there right, you can do it for the whole organization. So if you think once in a good way and make it compliant, it maybe it also fits for, for the rest of you. So that's it for as a short summary. Uh, let's look into the questions if we have some. And I see one that give me a second to check on that. We have something with regard to credentials. Um, yeah, there is an interesting question for you, Markus. So credentials are not allowed to be stored in config files. Any question is, uh, is that true or even, they, even if they are encrypted? Okay, good question. <laughs> um, so the standard does not explicitly mention encryption of the uh, credentials. So basically, um, it just says, uh, yeah, credentials are no longer allowed to be stored in configuration files. Um, so out of my head, but uh, as Kai said, it depends always. Uh, so um, we might to, yeah, you might to discuss this with your QSA also. Um, yeah, for example, like what kind of secrets are these? Uh, what, what kind of access would they allow? Um, but encryption might be a possibility to, to have them, yeah, out of the scope for for this uh, code repository topic here. So, but then the other question would maybe be, um, yeah, where's the decryption key? So, if it's also in your code repository somewhere in an environment variable, yeah, then it would be in scope again. So, it depends a bit on your situation. So, how is it? How is the secret decrypted? Uh, maybe I don't know if you are talking about something like Ansible Vault uh, feature where you can store uh, encrypted configuration files or something like that. As, yeah, then it might depend where the decryption key for this system lies. But if this is not in the possession of the code repository, that might be one possibility to put this out of scope, depending, of course, on the other workloads you are performing there. But uh, definitely you should uh, discuss this with your QSA and um, yeah, have a look at the yeah, whole workflow of your, of your pipeline and code repository and what it does. So it's not easy to give a general answer here, yeah, but this, yeah, like I said, might be one approach. Yeah, just as an addition, uh, secret management might be a hassle, that's that's for true, but luckily, of course, there are already secret uh, management services there uh, that are available for the, for the cloud, uh, from the cloud service provider, so you might also look into this. Um, as Marco said, there is no unique answer for, 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 for those questions because there are several options for this. And I think this is something that needs some still some involvement. Uh, I think that key management uh, by comparison has gone so far and it becomes so, not to say easy, but easily usable and easily de deployable also took, I don't know, maybe more than 10 years from now, even longer, I guess. And nowadays within the cloud, it's, it's, it's really kind of easy. Uh, and this is something that goes most probably the same for secrets, but unfortunately with secrets, we are more at the beginning of this of this journey. And uh, we have some examples and some, some different kind of how, do, how you're going to handle this, different solutions. But yeah, we will need to discuss this more in detail on, on, on your specific example. Um, if you have more questions about it, please come back to us on a personal level. We will help you out. Here you will find our uh, contact information within the slide as well. And I think that's it for today. Thank you very much for your for joining our webinar. And uh, hope to see you again next time. And have a nice have a nice day. Thank you. Everyone.